You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Uh, this is your host, Tim Link, and I'm so thankful you joined us today. I have a very special guest. My guest today is author Dr. Vint Verga. He's here to talk to us about his uh, latest book, The Soul of All Living Creatures. Uh, now, Dr. Verga, has, uh, he's a leader in veterinary and behavioral medicine. He consults with zoos and wildlife parks. Uh, he's appeared on numerous television and radio shows, including uh, ABC, National Geographic, PBS, Wild TV. So he is definitely an expert in his field, and this book, The Soul of All Living Creatures, is definitely a fascinating book. We're going to delve into the minds of people and their animals and take a look at what animals can teach us about being human. So everybody hang tight and we'll come right back after the commercial break. Uh, you're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Your dog digs a hole under your fence. And the next thing you know... Protect your pets with Dig Defense, the amazing new product that keeps your pets in the yard. Dig Defense is safe, fast, and easy. Each unit is made from 4-gauge galvanized American steel and can be used for repairing digouts, filling gaps, or to hold fences down so pets can't get under them. Dig Defense provides peace of mind that your pets are contained humanely and safely. Visit digdefense.com today. D-I-G-D-E-F-E-N-C-E dot com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. And joining me now is Dr. Vent Verga, who recently released his book, The Soul of All Living Creatures, What Animals Can Teach Us About Being Human. Dr. Verga, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much, Tim. It's nice to be here. Yeah, well, it's our pleasure. I definitely uh, tell our listeners a little bit about the book because I find it uh, extremely fascinating and taking an inside look at uh, people and, more importantly, uh, you know, their animals and what animals can teach us. So tell us a little bit about the premise and storyline of the book. Well, uh, I think the premise is based on my years in practice. I've been in practice. Um, I'm starting to approach up to 30 years, and most of that at this point has been in behavioral practice. Um, it, what I've found is that we assume we know what animals tick, but in truth, I feel we've really only scratched the surface of understanding them. Mm-hmm. And much of what we think we know are really misconceptions. They aren't really true at all. So the book, The Soul of All Living Creatures, I, I, my intention is that it helps readers to discover the complexities and, and the nuances of what animals think and feel so that we can have deeper relationships with them as well as with each other. So the book basically draws on the lessons I've learned from working with animals, both dogs and cats and other companion animals, as well as zoo animals through the years and what they have taught me about myself and my relationships with them, what they've taught my clients and the people with whom they either live or are in the care of. Explain just a little bit about the differences or or the nuances and the similarities between a, a veterinarian behaviorist and what we would typically know as a traditional veterinarian that treats the uh, ailments of an animal. Sure. Well, a veterinary behaviorist, to become a veterinary behaviorist, it requires that you be in practice for a certain number of years or, or serve an internship uh, more intensively so that someone has a grounding in general veterinary practice and in traditional medicine. And then to do a behavioral medicine residency, um, which is, um, allows you to specialize, what it basically involves is spending uh, three years nowadays in intensive behavior-focused work. Um, some of that is in research. Um, the research is strictly clinical. It isn't in a lab somewhere doing dissecting brains by any means. It's not invasive research in any way. Instead, it's research that in, in some sort of practical way, working usually with companion animals, sometimes with live or, or a more uh, exotic species. Um, and it also requires an extensive amount of work in, in a teaching hospital or in a uh, behavioral practice type setting with a mentor um, um, conducting rounds and working day to day with clients under the guidance of somebody that's already specialized in, in behavior and has become um, board certified in that specialty. What all, and then a huge amount of academic work um, so that by the end of the three years, 
um, of ordinary behavior is to have a real appreciation from everything about the behavior of across species, from lions, leopards, elephants, um, big cats, apes, um, down to rats and mice, frogs, um, reptiles. And knowing them on a behavioral level as a species, um, how they interact socially or, or what would be called the ethology of the species, all the way down to the molecular level and how neurotransmitters work and everywhere in between from, from our cells to our individual nuances and idiosyncrasies of behavior. It seems like a lot to put on a plate, and, and quite <laughs> it honestly a, is. <laughs> it is a lot. Yeah. Well, you've got this giant plate. Here, so I'll look at it as this way. You've got this giant plate of all these great goodies. You know, yeah. it's, it's like sitting down to dinner, and you've got all your favorites there. What do you do with that? I mean, how do you decide, okay, uh, what should I focus more with the client from a clinical standpoint? Or is this to should I break it down to a more simplistic approach that they can apply to their animals on a daily basis? How do you sort of decide where what to start uh, when you get your main course in front of you there? Well, um, the way in which I do it is I, I pay attention to what the individual client is. So if that's a, a dog or a cat owner, what I'm doing is, is asking what their specific needs are and also listening and watching and looking between the lines. And then also reading between the lines, I should say. And then also watching their animal. Um, and then trying to put together, okay, based on what my client is telling me, what their needs are, how do I best go about trying to help them? And it varies from animal to animal. In a zoo setting, um, it really is no different. I'm listening to the keepers, the people that, that spend their lives every day for a good eight hours a day or more caring for that animal, and that's their primary responsibility, um, in listening to what they're watching, noticing, and what, what it is that um, they're asking me to try to help with. And then I, it's a matter of, it's that interesting line between science or medicine being a science, but also an art. So, so at, at a very real level, it's something that's developed, I feel, intuitively through practice and experience. I love that, intuitively. So you uh, take all the knowledge you had and you blend that with your intuitiveness, your, your feelings, your gut feelings, the intuitive part of you to come up with solutions to help animals, help people build a better bond. Absolutely. You know, um, back when I was, I think it was freshman year of veterinary school, we were starting to get introduced at how to read x-rays, how to interpret lab results at a very, very early stage of our career. And I remember a professor, or more than one professor, teaching us that an animal doesn't walk on their x-rays or their lab work. Um, and what they were basically saying was, all the analytical tests in the world are not nearly as powerful as your medical intuition that you develop over the years. I don't. I look at it with behavior. I look at it beyond just a medical intuition. It's a feeling from working with the animals. You know, behavior is a science, but it also is a very subjective science. So it is open to interpretation. There are no blacks or whites, and a lot of it depends upon the skills and experience of the the person that's been working with um, the animals through the years. Absolutely. And when you talk about the uh, person that's working with the animal throughout these years, whether it's a domestic situation with uh, a pet, we'll call it, or it's a, at a zoo or aquarium on more of a professional level, when you're dealing with a behavior challenge, what does it boil down to? Do you find out that a lot of the challenges come directly from the animal? Or is it people-driven? Do people cause more of the issues than the animal do? Well, Tim, I think it's actually both. Um, I think that there's a fair number of animals that I see that um, people contribute to the behavioral issues that we see. And in some cases, um, quite honestly, there is no real behavioral issue. Um, it's more a matter of what expectations we're placing upon an animal to adapt to our human situation. For example, if we were to just talk about cats as an example, and litter box issues. When I used to do family companion animal behavior practice, a large percentage of the cat cases that I saw for out house soiling outside the litter box were because expectations were being placed upon the kitty that weren't realistic with a cat's normal behavior. The litter box environment or the specific substrates or types of litter that were being used and disturbances or, 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 the, or the privacy that they were being afforded. The opportunities that they were given all place um, expectations on an animal that sometimes are outside what would be considered part of their normal behavior. And all they're doing when they're um, eliminating outside the box is following more with their normal behavioral 
repertoire, if I could use that word, would be. Yeah, and do you feel also with it, especially in this case with the cat, is it, you know, cats are so brilliant. I tell my clients this all the time. There's very few animals out there that you can sit down in a plastic box, put some sand or litter in there, and, and they know exactly what to do with it. But, you know, I, I probably even, you know, with my consultations, I get called on that problem probably more than any other problem. And what I find is that cats will stop using the litter box in a lot of cases as a note fire to let you know that something's wrong. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And even when we're dealing with both with elimination purposes or from an elimination perspective, but also kitties use their excretions, urine and poop, if I, if I could put it bluntly, mm-hmm. um, sure. as ways to communicate. So they can also use them as a means to mark and, and they can remotely communicate to us, which would be part of their normal feline behavioral repertoire again. So I fully, fully agree with you about that. Yeah, yeah, and it's just up to better understand, is is there a physical problem going on that they're trying to make you aware of, or is it an emotional or a, a mental thing, or, or is there just something you're doing as their human companion that you're not doing well and you know, you're not doing right? Absolutely, I, yes. Well, tell me a little bit about then the the bond itself. You know, what is it about animals that you know allows us humans to feel you know such a strong bond with them? Well, that's interesting. I'm not a researcher in that field. I've looked at the research out there from anthropologists to historians to veterinarians to psychologists, and it's a fascinating field that's very, very complex. But what I can tell you is that this attraction that we humans have towards animals dates back to our earliest origins as a species. If we go back to the earliest cave art, it's very clear from from caves such as Lascaux or Chauvet in France um, during the early Ice Age or during the last Ice Age that, that our early, early ancestors were fascinated with animals and they held them with not only curiosity but also a respect and reverence that has that continued, I feel, to this very day. I think that that same fascination is what ultimately motivates and inspires us to bring animals into our lives. And what I feel we're actually seeing when we look at animals and is that we're seeing a reflection of ourselves. Mm. We tend to think as humans that we are not animals, and yet in reality we are. We've evolved differently, but we are an animal species. And just like any other animal species, we have a lot of similarities that I think that we tend not to recognize. That's a key element of the book is to to look at those similarities and to look at the lessons that we can learn about ourselves from the way in which they live in their lives. When you talk about those different or those similarities, whether it's animals feeling uh, love, compassion, sorrow, uh, all these things we experience, they experience as well, correct? Absolutely. Um, Animals, I think that if not universally, the clear majority of your uh, listeners would all agree that the animals that they have in their lives, they recognize as having unique personalities, unique identities. They have preferences, they have likes and dislikes. Most people feel that their animals actually share the emotions that they do and that they respond to our human fancies and emotions and moods. The statistics are in America that 94% of us talk to our animals as if we're human and that 9 out of 10 of us feel that our, that our animals respond to our human moods and feelings. What we are identifying there is we're identifying that animals have spirits and essences that are that are unique and different for each individual being and that is their identity their soul their character their spirit yeah and i'm glad you i agree with you wholeheartedly on that and i'm glad you brought that up because each one does have their own personality i mean you can have and we'll say two dogs from the same litter living in the same household but each one of them has their own unique likes and dislikes and behaviors and how they go about uh, handling their daily life. Without a doubt, without a doubt. Now, does that hold true when you're talking about domestic animals compared to, say, wild animals or animals in the zoo? Do they still share the same feelings and do they have their own unique personalities as well? Oh, uh, among my patients at the zoo, uh, if you were to follow me for a day or any of your listeners to, would, I wouldn't even have to answer that question for you. <laughs> <laughs> you would know without a doubt that they're all very unique and they have very different personalities. 
They have uh, senses of humor. They have a graciousness. They have different aspects to their personality where they really connect with, with humans. And I feel that they're all of those unique aspects of the spirit that we see in our companion animals, we I see every day in the animals I work with in zoos and wildlife, wildlife parks. That's right. Everybody, humans and animals alike, have their own personalities and their own uh, way of uh, dealing with life. We just have to figure out ways to uh, better understand that and to have better relationships with them. Yes. Absolutely. Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Uh, We'll come back and uh, with our conversation with Dr. Vint Verga, talk a little bit more about the book, The Soul of All Living Creatures. And I want to delve into the writing aspects and talk to him a little bit about that. So everybody hang tight. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. I'm not much of a reader, but I do wish I were more well-read. There are so many great books coming out. I wish I could find a way to keep up. Audible.com makes it easy to stay well-informed and catch up on your reading simply by listening. Audiobooks from Audible turn downtime into uptime. You'll be more productive and become well-read. Now I'm able to catch up on all the great books I've been wanting to read. With Audible, I feel smarter. Pet Life Radio listeners, try Audible.com now and get your first 30 days of Audible Listener Gold Membership plan free. And get a free audiobook. Choose from over 100,000 titles. To get this great deal, go to AudibleDeals.com. That's AudibleDeals.com. Hi, this is Tim Link, animal communicator and pet expert and host of Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have you ever wanted to know what your pet is really thinking? Do you want to find out if they truly understand what you're trying to tell them? Ever wish you could build a better understanding and closer relationship with your pet? Well, now you can. Learning to communicate with animals is a four-part on-demand workshop. In the workshop, you'll learn the essential techniques that are necessary to communicate with animals, including what is animal communication, breathing correctly to achieve the perfect state to communicate with your animals at a deeper level, using guided meditation exercises and method to communicate with animals, and how to send and receive information from your animals. So if you're wanting to learn how to communicate and connect with your animals at a deeper level, visit PetLifeRadio.com forward slash workshop and purchase and download Learning to Communicate with Animals. You'll be glad you did. Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Werber from Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff here on Pet Life Radio. We want to hear from you. Listen in. We're on every Thursday, 1 o'clock Pacific Time, 4 o'clock Eastern Time here on PetLifeRadio.com. We are one of the only live shows on Pet Life Radio, and I'm here to answer your questions. So you can call in at 877-385-8882, or you can drop me an email to drjeff at PetLifeRadio.com, and hopefully we'll see you here on Thursdays. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and I'm here with Dr. Vent Verga talking to him a little bit about his latest book, The Soul of All Living Creatures, What Animals Can Teach Us About Being Human. Now, Dr. Verga, tell me a little bit about as far as writing the book. You got all this wonderful knowledge, 30 years plus experience, uh, all these great stories to tell. What made you wake up one day and say, hey, I ought to write a book? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I ever woke up one day. It's actually been a passion of mine to write for many years. And it was, um, it was at the, the gentle but persistent prodding of my wife and daughter and my staff at work that finally said, you know what, I think you need to finally restructure your practice so that you give yourself the time to write. In terms of actually sitting down and doing it, it's been such a journey to step into a world that, that is so different from the world in which I work day to day with, with animals. And it's been um, filled with amazing struggles <laughs> that are totally new to me, but also incredible highs and joys from from finally being able to put down in words the types of things that I talk about with people one-on-one. I see them connecting and identifying with when I'm meeting with a client or a keeper at a zoo. Absolutely. So uh, elaborate a little bit more on that. What, what would you say are some of the, uh, the ease of putting together the book and writing the book and, and maybe some of the challenges? What were the biggest hurdles you had to overcome? 
Well, some of the joys in writing the book were being able to set out in writing some of the misconceptions that are dominant in our, in our culture about animals and um, our interactions with them and offering a totally different perspective from the perspective of um, a veterinary behaviorist um, mm -hmm. in both companion animal and zoo practice. But beyond that, um, just the challenges, I would say, were um, I tend to be very precise in my language. <laughs> and so it was a, definitely a challenge to switch from writing scientific articles and presenting to veterinarians to presenting things in a much more artistic fashion so that I could create a book that my hope is, was would be very compelling and, and engaging and interesting. And that was a several year process. I'm um, learning how to to really express myself and giving myself the freedom. I don't have to cite every single reference, um, but instead could actually um, just just allow the words to flow in a much more conversational and, and fun tone. Based on the feedback I've gotten, I think it, hopefully it's been successful in, in being entertaining and engaging and, as some would say, a page turner. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you, you've done a great job with it. I think you've accomplished what you set out to accomplish with it. Now, by putting together the book and learning these sort of new techniques, new ways to sort of break it down to uh, the common man, I'll call it, to make sure everybody understands. Do you think that helped your in your practice? Do you think that's helped you uh, help people better understand? Well, I think that it's helped me um, reach out to a much larger audience, which was really the inspiration for the book. Um, to talk with people one on one and to see see how they their eyes open to a fresh new perspective. You mean my cat might be thinking this as we were talking about earlier? Mm -hmm. If a cat's eliminating outside of a litter box, or why is it that my dog has, wants to stop and sniff at every lamppost? What are they smelling? What is my dog hearing when when he's barking in the middle of the night that I'm totally oblivious to? Why is it that when I go to the zoo, I see the zebras doing this and the wolves doing that? Um, to be able to talk with to a larger group rather than one on one was was I think one of the the big motivations and gifts of the book. There you go. That sounds great. Now I have to ask you this: from what you mentioned, your your wife and your daughter, I'm assuming they go to the uh, zoos with you to visit uh, the wonderful animals. Certainly, my daughter has more than um, my wife. My wife's a veterinary dermatologist, so she's <laughs> often in the clinic while I'm at <laughs> so, so she's getting a fill of it, knee deep into it. Well, with your daughter, does she ask you every time you cross a you know a particular animal, what's an animal thinking, or what's an animal doing, or why is he doing that? Is she very inquisitive when it comes to that? We tend to talk about those types of things um, oftentimes on the ride back home or later at dinner or the next day sometimes. But um, I also think that after at 10 years old, she's um, and, and having been going to zoos now for, oh golly, I think six years, I think it's amazing to me how much she's picked up on intuitively. So now when she looks at an animal, instead of asking me a lot of times, what's that animal thinking or feeling? Now she's asked me a lot of times, was he doing this because of this? Or, or what did you think about that? This is what I thought. And, and I think that we all, it's not like my daughter has some unique talent. We all as humans have that talent to be able to become more sensitive and aware and, and focused on and interpretive in a much more meaningful way of what our animals are doing if we only are willing to give a little bit more energy and dedication and focus to it in the day. It doesn't take a whole lot to, to become more aware and sensitive towards the animals around us. Absolutely. And, you know, I always tell my clients, you know, uh, slow down, take a breath. You know, spend some quiet time with your animals and what you're picking up, your intuition, the things that you're feeling more than likely are spot on. Oh, well said. Perfectly said. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, tell me then when we're talking about writing a book, we've got the book, you're out there promoting the book and uh, getting uh, your word out, getting the message out. And I spoke a little bit earlier about your many TV appearances. What do you think the challenges are? Do you find one method of medium a little bit more challenging uh, speaking compared to television, compared to writing? How does that all come into play? Well, I think it's all a matter of just changing gears for me. I, I will tell you in all honesty, I'm I'm a classic introvert, so I feel <laughs> like anytime I do anything, talking with you on the telephone, I'm putting on a hat that, that is new and different to me, but I like doing different things. 
and so I feel like each different step, it, whether it be reading on the book tour or, um, or, or being on radio or on television, is, is a new opportunity. And, and at this stage, to me, it's all still very exciting and, and invigorating and fun. And I, I can't imagine it ever would be anything different. I would agree with you on that as well because even each situation uh, is different because you can be on a, uh, a book tour, press circuit, whatever it may be, and you go into one television station, say in uh, Des Moines that morning and then two hours later into a different network and the questions they ask you and how they handle things and your approach, you're trying to keep it direct and the same, keep your pitch going, but it's different each time, so you have to sort of be on your toes. It's so different. It's so, so different. And it's the same in working with clients, even when we're dealing with behavioral issues. I'm sure you find the same, that even when you're dealing with an identical behavioral issue in two different animals, the clients, the individual animals, the scene in which we're, they're living in, all directly impact how we go about working with the situation and, and, and solving it to the best of everybody's needs. Yeah, and would you uh, say, uh, without pointing fingers at one gender or another, is there a particular gender that accepts your thoughts and your recommendations more than the other gender? Wow, I don't know if there's specific statistics out there yet. I can tell you that that when we're talking about the types of um, issues of sensitivity and awareness and, and all that, what I've been told is that it would have uh, the book's going to have more appeal to um, uh, a female audience, and yet I feel like I've talked to countless numbers of men of all varieties of ages, from college students all the way up to elderly gentlemen with their cattle or or a single uh, cat living in a cottage on a farm that, that all identify and relate to what we're talking about, what I'm talking about in the book. And that, Tim, I think it's because it draws back ultimately to that, that kinship and connection which we all have, that special bond which we've shared with animals. That isn't a gender-specific trait. That, that's a human trait that I feel we, that clearly, uh, it's not even a matter of feeling, that clearly we all, all of us humans have some more than others, but, but that intimate bond we share with an animal is something that's very special and private, and it's just as touching to a young college student away from home for his very first time as it is to an elderly couple with their aging dog. So yeah, so when it comes down to not only the gender, but I think you're right in the fact that you know animals in our life, whether it's animals uh, that are in our homes or outside of our homes, we have that love and passion and connection with them. And, and ultimately, we want what's best for them. Uh, I think it's just up to you and to I to try to figure out how we best uh, approach it based on each individual. Yeah, and to honor that. And I think the starting point is honoring that special connection and realizing that what we have with that animal is worth investing our time and energy and, and attention towards. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, it's, you know, I never like to break things down from a, from a dollar or a business standpoint, but, you know, animals are just huge parts of our lives. We spend a lot of money on them and time on them. So why don't we do it the right way? Why don't we spend more time to better understand them and look at it from a, uh, a relationship standpoint? Yes. And I think the starting point with all that is really trying to step into the shoes or may I say, pause of, of an animal that we're close with and trying to really open our eyes and our ears and, and, and all of our senses to a perspective that is not typically something we take in our day-to-day lives. But if we're willing to just step out of our shoes for, for a few moments even, um, I think our animals can teach us remarkable lessons. Absolutely. Open yourself up to them and let them, let them teach you. So I think it's a brilliant way to put it. Now, after our readers uh, read The Soul of All Living Creatures, what would you hope would be the takeaway? What would be the, the one or, or a few bits of takeaway that you'd want the readers to get out of the book? I think that is the starting point right there, to recognize that we as humans are animals too, and we have different traits than the animals around us. We're not better. We've evolved differently. We're not worse. We're just different. And in the same way that our dogs can pick up smells and our cats can hear sounds that we as humans can't even um, begin to fathom. They're picking up on a part of the world that we are really oblivious to or indifferent to. If we're willing to watch and notice and, and look and, and 
uh, study them, even just as we're sitting and having a coffee in the morning or at the end of the day as we're laying down and picking up our book in our, with our dog or cat by our side, watching them and noticing what they're doing, we can um, stop and say, you know, what is it that, that they can offer us as a lesson today? Even if it's nothing more than the comfort of being with them and realizing that this is the first moment we've, we've relaxed at all in the day compared to all the times we were with other people. Um, so I think it's a matter of my hope is that people would take on the idea of this being that there's a whole exciting, diverse world out there beyond what we know as human beings. And the possibilities, quite honestly, are, I think I think are endless in terms of um, where we can go with the lessons our animals can teach us just by trying to um, step into the world from their perspective, even if only for a moment. Very good. Brilliantly put. Very brilliantly put. So where can our listeners find out more about you and about the book and all the activities and appearances you're going to be at? Well, it's certainly on my website, um, vintverga.com. Um, they can go to my Facebook page, which is also just um, my name. And um, I have anywhere I'm appearing listed on the events page of that. They can read more about the book and excerpts by going to Crown or Random's House website, um, but also um, also any bookstore, um, both um, in the real world or in the um, on the Internet. They'll be able to find excerpts of the book. They'll be able to uh, purchase the book. And um, then any media clips, any any appearances also are appearing, of course, as, as with your show as they're posted online at the various networks. Absolutely. So everybody go to uh, VinVerga.com, learn more about the book, pick up a copy of the book, The Soul of All Living Creatures, What Animals Can Teach Us About Being Human. Dr. Verga, it was fascinating talking to you. I appreciate it very much. The book was uh, is a great read and definitely gets you uh, thinking a little bit more. And yeah, by all means, everybody uh, learn to have a uh, the best relationship possible with the animals in your life. Well, it was wonderful to join you. Uh, thanks so much for inviting. Our pleasure, our pleasure. Well, we're winding down today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Vent Verga for being on the Animal Rights Show. Also, I'd like to thank uh, all the listeners and all the sponsors and the producers for putting on such a wonderful show. To find out more about me, Tim Link, and other guests I've interviewed on the Animal Rights Show and the stories on my blog, you can take a look at PetLifeRadio.com, PetLifeRadio.com. Click on the animal rights icon and learn all about uh, what's going on in my world as well as download your favorite episodes from wonderful uh, writers and uh, and bloggers and authors. And while you're at it, uh, make sure you check out all the other wonderful hosts of the numerous shows we have on Pet Life Radio. Uh, a lot of fascinating things going on. So that's BetLifeRadio.com. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas about this show, you can email me. You can email me at Tim at PetLifeRadio.com. That's Tim at PetLifeRadio.com. And I'll be glad to answer your questions, uh, entertain your comments, and bring on the people you want to hear the most. So until next time, write a great story about the animals in your life. Share it in a blog, article, or in a book. And who knows, you may be the next guest on Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have a great day. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com.